Thank you very much, Kerry. And thank you to Philip, Brian, and Siku for joining us today. It's always good to be sharing information and learning from one another. I'm going to start at the top left of my screen with Brian, just to introduce yourself. And Brian, um, I know you're not on our continent, but we were discussing horses and outdoor stuff. What do you do for Beyond Trust and why are you good to have on this panel in your opinion? Oh, that last piece is a good one, I feel. But uh, um, I, I'm Brian Chappell. I've been with uh, Beyond Trust now for a little over 10 years. Uh, started as a sales engineer looking after EMEA and then picking up APAC and through various roles, including product. I'm now a uh, chief security strategist, um, which is odd. There's two of us, but I primarily focus in EMEA and APAC and talking to people about uh, their challenges and their concerns and how they can best apply our technologies, other people's technologies uh, in their cybersecurity strategies. So, you know, having a, a long career myself in both uh, being a, a purchaser of IT equipment and services, as well as a user of those things as well, positions me very well to have a good feel for what the people on the other end of this webinar are going through, as well as being able to bring forward the, the knowledge that we get from being on the vendor side as well. Um, so hopefully we can give some people, uh, the people something they can take away and do something with today. And I think it's going to be fantastic. So Brian, now that um, uh, borders are opening up again and we're getting into a, a level of normalcy, if you had to take a holiday trip to one of your business destinations on the continent, where would it be and why do you think so? Um, I think uh, for, for the continent of Africa, um, I've, uh, I've, I went down to uh, Cape Town many, many years ago um, and uh, I had a fantastic week down there. And I have to say, after the long 11 and a half hour flight, it was the first time I've walked off the plane and actually felt like I'd uh, I'd reached somewhere I wanted to be. Um, wow. It was it was amazing coming down over Cape Town as the sun rose in the aircraft and seeing the sun come up. I walked out the beautiful air and I just kind of thought this is this feels like home. So I'd love to come back to Cape Town. Uh, some colleagues of mine did an event there a few years ago and still rib me to this day that I had to be, I think I was in Germany or somewhere else, so I didn't get to come. So I'd, I would love to come back down and see Cape Town. But there's so much of Africa I haven't seen. Um, you know, you could spend a lifetime traveling around there, I feel. I'm glad. Well, I, we are I'm opening the doors to the continent for you. If we can go to Kigali, we can go to Nairobi, we can go to Khabarone, I'll be there with you, no problems. Felipe, from a last minute call up reserve off the bench, thank you for joining us today. We know that uh, that your name wasn't on the bill, but I'm really glad you have joined us. Felipe, what do you do for Beyond Trust and, and why are you joining us today? Well, thank you, Dan and team. I'm uh, Felipe Galvao, responsible for enterprise business in the African region, Weka, as we know it, the West, East, Central and Southern Africa. Um, been in the security realm for probably about 15 years in Africa. So uh, back to Brian, whenever you want to come in and uh, join us, please let me know. I'll take you around. Outside of South Africa, Felipe, what's your favorite country from a food perspective on the continent? Where's the most exciting? Oh, wow. That would be biased. Eh? I am Portuguese, so it would have to be Mozambique, without a doubt. Oh, branche, branche, frango. Come yeah, oh, there we go, come around. Oh, that is great. Thank you, Felipe, and thanks for joining us. Um, um, we know that Brett uh, had an emergency which came up, and we just want to wish him well. So if you were expecting to see the good-looking Brett, we got subbed by the younger, <laughs> better-looking Felipe, so that's cool. Siku, our guest from, um, from a different perspective, today we've got a hacker on the line, and you're going to explain what ethical hacking is for us. But before we go there, where are you from and um, how did you get here? Why, why should we be listening to you today? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, you know, I'm a local guy, South African, uh, born and bred in South Africa. So I've always had a passion uh, for cybersecurity, then uh, particularly ethical hacking. So I think what I'm going to bring forth, what I'm going to share, what I'm going to expound, what I'm going to 
basically uh, share with the community is uh, more around um, uh, cyber security in terms of ethical hacking, more of uh, TTPs as well as um, um, security assurance and adoption of uh, security controls, how to safeguard against uh, this, um, not just simply a security risk, but we are more looking around uh, the sophisticated attacks uh, today that we are facing today. How can we prevent those? How can we mitigate? How can we uh, reduce the attack surface around that? Now, before we go in this, in your culture, we don't we don't have a traditional meal that has a dessert. And I know that's a very particular thing to an African culture, especially in the South. So if you have to anglicize yourself, if you had to invite Brian for dinner, what dessert would you serve him and why would you serve him that? Uh, I think uh, in, in, in terms of a uh, dessert, because uh, I think it would be your, your normal uh, custard and, and uh, pudding. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, <laughs> that would be that. Oh, you've just won the vote from Europe. From, from the England. <laughs> Warm custard. Eh? So, Siku, before we get into PAM and the differences between PAM and IAM and, and I start throwing questions at you guys, let's just talk, what is an ethical hacker do do you hack with a big conscience i mean do you try and break into people and say sorry about that sorry about that what what, what how did this career come about and why is it pertinent in the security space uh so ju ju just to answer that one uh basically an ethical hacker we, we operate within um uh it is it, basically an a proactive uh form of um uh, cyber security, where we look at a uh, security related uh, risk. And if we find that uh, risk, basically we're hired by organization to look at, uh, to improve their security posture. When we find any uh, security related uh, risk, we document uh, those uh, findings and we also present uh, solutions around that. So a normal uh, hacker uh, looking at um, the activist, looking at script kiddies, when they find this uh, security witnesses, they normally exploit and uh, take advantage of this uh, of this uh, security flaws. So they don't necessarily report against this. They don't even issue any uh, mitigation around this. They don't even document. They just compromise. We have seen even recently, uh, TransUnion has been uh, compromised, has been hacked by one of the uh, Brazilian um, uh, group. So normally what they do, they use this. So just slow down then. Just for, for our, our, our friends north of the border, TransUnion is quite a big company in South yes. Africa. Uh, if you haven't heard about that hack, it was all over our papers. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it made it north, but uh, TransUnion was quite important. Why, Siku? Why was that quite important for us? So because uh, TransUnion is actually... Um, uh, they collect a uh, credit uh, information. They've got all our personal information when you uh, credit a bureau. So they've got uh, uh, collect uh, data uh, for this, uh, for this uh, is their business model. So when they were compromised, they were hacked. They've hacked one of their channel, uh, uh, SFTP, secure file transfer. So they've compromised that. They've compromised one of their customers and they gain access into, into that repository and the exfiltrated data. So to exfiltrate data is to actually um, uh, copy data from that uh, storage into your own through uh, from their network and, and they've deleted that uh, data. So Looking at this, we see that they've compromised uh, a credential. They've compromised user, user credentials. So I think we'll also talk in line on how PAM can actually uh, uh, mitigate uh, such a risk related to, to password. Okay, so awesome. Is. I think we're going to ask Brian and, and Philippe about that significant uh, or, or, or quite a bit. Um, when you come out and you've just said credentials, they stole their credentials and they used them. How does an ethical hacker like you prevent that? Isn't that what Brian and Philippe and, and the Beyond Trust team is meant to be doing? Or the inbuilt security team? So, so normally when it comes to uh, emulating, we call it uh, adversary emulation. Adversary emulation, basically, we are looking at uh, the techniques that an attacker will actually 
uh, uh, the steps, how they execute all this initial access, looking at uh, credentials. So we emulate that process end-to-end. Uh, -end. We look at security uh, um, misconfiguration, security flaws. If we identify anything, we document that and work closely with uh, the defense team. Just uh, the reason why we work closely with the defense team, because this is an ethical approach. This is actually to improve security controls within the organization. So, uh, so attackers, they don't go through this. They don't even share this knowledge. They just compromise yeah. and they use this for extortion. With ethical hacking, we provide, we provide guidance and we close the gap between the defense team. We're coming from the red team, we're coming from the pen test, we're coming from the assume bridge uh, pen test, looking uh, at this uh, uh, tactics and we emulate those tactics and we say, okay, we'll find the gap here. Maybe the password, the password was not um, uh, uh, encrypted on runtime, on runtime meaning when you, the user log in into the system, once they log in into the system, that a uh, user uh, a uh, string username and password is presented in plain text. Now we'll go back to to uh, uh, into the drawing board. It's a people teaming exercise as well. We're going back to the drawing board. We say, okay, because of this uh, flow, we need to fix this. We need to encrypt this, and this also talks to zero trust, a uh, 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 secure by design as well principle, because you need to ensure that there is end-to-end -end encryption uh, based on credentials, based on data, uh, on runtime data on the store, data that is on rest, it needs also to be, to be uh, uh, protected, it needs to be encrypted. And also depending on what type of data are we transmitting. Is it PCI data? Is it uh, uh, PCI data? Is it, uh, 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 how valuable is this data? So we need to ensure that we, we provide these controls, we provide guidance, and we say, okay, we've tested this application, we can compromise the user password, we can see data being presented in plain text, you need to provide encryption. These are documented, this is it's an exercise uh, internally, it's, uh, we share this and we go into the drawing board to close the gaps for the defense team to be able. Now, if an attacker wants to compromise the stack and wants to uh, compromise the organization, the, the SOC team has already provided, uh, they are aware of this uh, uh, yeah. tactics and techniques and they're able to defend the organization. So that so is you, uh, ethical hacking. So you almost the auditors with a plan. That's really nice. Yes. I want to take a, take a pause. I'm going to come back to you, Siki. That's a great dive into ethical hacking, but you touched on a few points there. And we were talking about um, IAM and PAM and Zero Trust, and you dropped a couple of things. So Brian, earn your, earn your pounds. Why is PAM important to us and what's different from PAM and IAM? And do we have to use three letter acronyms for everything? What, what, what are they? Well, I mean, the use of TLAs in, in IT, uh, which is obviously three letter acronyms, <laughs> uh, uh, can also be two letter, but we won't we'll go there. IT has always been great in that there's always a great saying that, that IT is great for standards because there are so many to choose from, which makes it difficult. Um, but it, it, it's just a habit. But, uh, you know, Zero Trust, uh, PAM, those kinds of things are really manifestations of how our environments are changing. Um, yeah, we've seen an acceleration of things over the past couple of years with the pandemic which were already somewhat in motion, which is that move away from the centralized environment where literally everyone works in one building and like the walls and the edges of the communication on the edge of that building are the, are the fortress, the, the perimeter that uh, you know, we defend with a passion uh, and try and prevent people getting through. Um, you know, over the years, it's become immensely apparent. And as you can mention, the attack surface, the attack surface is growing and has been growing since I picked up my first computer, probably in 1981. Um, you know, when I first worked, wasn't born yet. Yeah, exactly. Wasn't born yet. <laughs> exactly. I know that's where it gets embarrassing. Uh, I was only 11 at the time. I, would say. Uh, I got my first computer, but uh, it was... Um, Hey, when I first worked in an office, we had no networks. We had no external connectivity. Then as networks started to come in, it's, it's all contained within the building. You're just, you can see everything you're protecting. And then it begins to expand and you know, started having cloud and all these external connections. And now we've moved things out into the cloud entirely. So our networks have actually become very modular. And the term that came to me recently about it is it's kind of gone fractal. 
you know, we get these repeated scenarios, you know, everything we have out there in the environment needs to be protected. And when you are that dispersed in the number of systems and environments you have to try and protect, you come down to what's actually the common thing across all of those. And it's about identities. Um, you know, your identity is the thing that gains you access to all those different systems. And we have to make sure that we're controlling those. So identity and access management is a foundational piece uh, of what I would call for cybersecurity uh, and an important place to, to uh, focus. As an aside, you know, I used to work at GlaxoSmithKline as a contractor over like 11 years. I was there for 10 and a half years. Uh, my last contract was three months long and I was there for six and a half years. Uh, at one point I left and came back. When I left, I had seven privileged accounts in the system. I came back 15 months later and six of my accounts were still active because they weren't in Active Directory. They were elsewhere. Um, and those privileged accounts have access to everything in each of those environments. And so this is where privileged account management becomes a bit more of a concern. It's just about the level of access you have. So just just yeah. pause there. One of the comments um, in, the, in the chat, uh, Jean-Paul um, said, use, explain to us the meaning of PAM and I am in full words, please. I'm full so, words. so just say Pam again. Say that again for me, yeah. Brian. So Pam, unfortunately, generally has two uh, common uh, expansions. It's either privileged account management or privileged access management. We tend to refer to it as privileged access management. <laughs> So it's not, you know, uh, so you could talk about credentials and credentials are the things that authenticate you into the system. And then normally we talk about there being authorization beyond that. So, uh, you know, credentials get you authentication, authorization happens beyond that. And it's about that authorization layer. What does this thing get you access to? And how do I control when, where, how, and in some cases, why you have that access? Um, <laughs> And Siku will probably be able to talk to this later as well about the, the we talked to the attack surface. There's also the attack chain. And this is, you know, both of these things are things I lament because I've been saying the same things for 10 or more years now. Uh, they haven't really changed. An attacker will come in through a vulnerability, whether it's technical or human. And that really covers just about anything from clicking on a phishing link to downloading the wrong application to picking up a USB stick in the car park and plugging it into your work machine and all the technical issues it can have through configuration and everything else. Once they land on the machine, it's unlikely to be where they need to be. So they'll look to move across your network, lateral movements, as we call it. And for that, they invariably need some kind of privilege because the standard user gets you onto the box you're on doesn't get you across the network generally. So that's where the privilege piece comes because they'll get through the vulnerability. The first thing they're looking for is a privileged account. So the more control we have in that space, the more we have to stop the person. You know, we've all heard that it's not if, it's when. Um, and that is absolutely true. And I've often said at conferences, if you haven't, don't think you've been hacked yet, you probably got lucky and they didn't find anything that was useful. Um, but um, so, so wait, wait, pause there, Brian, pause. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, Brian, you come with a wealth of knowledge and CQ, you come with a whole different avenue of knowledge. I want to, I want to bring Philippe in from a more of a, a business person. Philippe, what does zero trust mean to you from a beyond trust perspective? And how does it tie into what Brian and Siko are talking around? And uh, I, I would love to just, just answer the first one and then we can dive into the second. What is zero trust? What does it mean for our audience today? Yeah, thanks, uh, Dan. So exactly like um, Siko and, and, and Brian have mentioned, um, Siko alluded to, from a business perspective, a lot of organizations tend to have many disparate solutions and systems and legacy solutions and systems. And um, zero trust, I think, you know, to put it bluntly is uh, trust nothing and, and validate everything. So from organizations that are, that are building, um, more often than not, security is an afterthought. So you, you want them to put that into their planning when building a network, uh, ensure that security is of course, utmost importance. And uh, if, you, if you go in believing that 
nothing can be trustworthy and that you need to continuously uh, validate all, all people and, and, um, and access to, to privileges. So everybody is treated equal by having no faith in them. Is that what we're saying? Are we going to authenticate everybody? Brian, I can, I can see you. You're nodding. Is, am, am I on there, Philip? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, all equal? No. Of course, there's, uh, as Brian mentioned earlier on, there's, uh, there's certain privileges and access to those privileges. Uh, you know, you can't give an administrator the same privileges or access as an as a IT um, analyst. It's got to be it's got to be different from that perspective. Okay. All right. Um, Brian, I've got quite an interesting question for you that's come through via LinkedIn. If you don't know, all of you that are on this call, you're also on LinkedIn. That's amazing. Um, where Richard is asking, we know zero trust technology is often able to block access from certain listed geographic locations, but are they supporting impossible travelers yet? So if uh, we take Siku, who is on our trusted list, and he travels to a, um, a geographic location which is embargoed or tied off, is there a way that he can get access to what he needs to, to do his job? Well, that, uh, that's an interesting, challenging question, probably not directly uh, Zero Trust related, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, you are you are at the mercy of uh, regulatory compliances wherever you go, and if your organisation, uh, for whatever reason, cannot allow access from a location, there really isn't much you can do about that. If it's accessed back into your environment, you know we see more and more services being moved towards the cloud, and in those scenarios, it may be something that can then be accessed because actually the system itself is hosted in the country that doesn't have the similar kind of controls. Um, I'd be, I'm somewhat loath to mention VPNs in terms of, uh, of access. Um, you know, we've all used them from uh, countries that have tight restrictions on their internet uh, services, et cetera, to get back to I it. I don't want to go down the rabbit. I don't want to go down the rabbit hole. I, I thought if Beyond Trust had a, a way of identifying a user, we, they would say it. So this, the simple answer is it's complicated. I think you, 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 yeah. you wanted to add something to that or... Can I ask you another question? Uh, based on, on uh, regions. Yeah, if you wanted to, but I would like to ask you something different. I would like to ask you, um, um, this, Brian spoke about this attack surface, which is rapidly morphing because of our work from anywhere. And I especially think about our friends up north in, in Africa, where we are expanding at a huge rate. If you had to say the three things that that would give you, as uh, if you went into an environment to give the give you a sense of okay, these guys know what they're doing from a zero trust perspective, especially on PAM, um, privileged access management perspective. What are the three things you look for in somewhere to see if there's a weakness or if they are on the right track? So based, when it comes to uh, zero trust, zero trust um, security, firstly, we need to look at um, identity, uh, identity, how, how access is, is managed. We look at uh, endpoints, endpoints, we are talking about the, uh, your, your malware inspection, security controls related to, to endpoints. We are looking at data, how data is being managed. We are looking at applications. Uh, we are looking at infrastructure. We're also looking at the network. That is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, zero trust. So we are looking at this end-to-end. Uh, -end. So that is a security end-to-end, -end, encryption end-to-end. -end. We're looking at IM, how it's being uh, driven. It's end-to-end. -end. So in some instances, you find this um, in an organization. They would have the identity and access management. They will have an endpoint. Uh, they will have a uh, data controls, how to control the data, to tokenize the data, to mask the data, to encrypt the data on applications. Applications, it's required to have SSL implementation and it needs to meet the certain standard. Maybe it's TLS 1.2, the minimum. On the infrastructure, we are looking at segmentation uh, on the network uh, as well. So 
within an organization, sometimes it's not it's not possible to to have all this end to end, to have encryption end to end. You require an an exception. So an exception is to say I'm aware of this uh, 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 problem. I'm disclosing this, so I need an an, an exception so that uh, uh, this is uh, basically for audit and everyone to be aware. But when an attacker is able to gain access into that environment. An attacker won't say you have an exception. An attacker won't say, no, 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 this exception, uh, we understand that you are transmitting your data in plain text. Data on the store does not have a, a, a encryption on data on rest. The attacker just come in and hit the environment and also move uh, laterally. If there's any witnesses when it comes to identity, then they start, uh, basically, it's that, that is the initial access. That is initial access. We can also map this uh, uh, from the, the ethical hacking perspective to map this as well with a MITRE attack framework, because this, there should be a framework in place on how to inform this uh, type of attacks. They should so that be, would be your first thing you would look for is a framework. Yes, you took a politician's way of getting there. <laughs> So the first thing we look for is a framework. Okay, now I'm with you. Yes, Sikhi. yes. Are you got a yes. pause now? Uh, 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 uh. I'm coming back to you because I want to. I want to ask that of Brian. And um, Brian, how do you know when you've got a sale? When when someone comes in, they want to have zero trust. What are the things that say they definitely need you? What are we missing? Um, it's it's an interesting one uh, in that uh, I find actually uh, frustratingly over those 10 years of saying the same things that the attacks that happen are still coming in through the same routes and the same accesses. The attack chain hasn't changed. So invariably, when somebody's coming forward saying, you know, we'd like to look at zero trust and we're thinking about this, you'll talk to them about what they have in place currently, as Siki was saying. He's going in and looking for those things directly. We'll ask them, you know, what kind of controls they have in place. And invariably, you'll find gaps in what I would call the fundamental technologies of cybersecurity. Yes. Um, and uh, years ago, in a, a, I was at a conference in Dubai, and I looked out in the morning from my hotel room, and I could see out into the desert. And I thought about the sands being a bit like the attack surface, and that it's constantly moving. And yeah, you know, when you think about building your cybersecurity strategy, zero trust or otherwise, um, you're building a platform out there and you're building this beautiful edifice on top of it where you're putting all your controls in place, but then the sand shifts and the whole thing topples over. So there are these foundational pieces, these piles you have to sink down through the sand that are going to anchor your cybersecurity strategy. So anytime I find that those foundational piles... So what are those? What There's are a good they? few of them. Um, we we cover... Three. Yeah, top three. I mean, I would actually have to stick in the space where we operate. Privileged yeah. access management is fundamental. Getting control over those is a big bang for your buck is the best way to put it. Um, endpoint privilege management, because the endpoint is still the most likely place a hacker is going to land in your environment, even if they are an internal person themselves. Um, so getting control over privilege on those endpoints, making sure people don't have too much access is is fundamental and then securing the remote access both inside your environment and from outside in we see so many vendor based attacks coming in as well and if you think about it those are all really basic they can be really simple they're not yes. tied to one another so you're not you don't have to do it all at once you can pick away at these things but when you've got those kind of things in place and then you move on to vulnerability patch management configuration management they're all just fundamentals that just get put to one side because they're seen as boring, dull, not important right so, now. <laughs> so we've got we've got um, two questions in the, in the chat that are almost the same. Danielle and Slindili have asked us. The first one is how do we how does combining IAM and PAM solutions help organisations achieve zero trust? And then hot on the heels, Slindili is saying. How do we prepare for a zero trust model in the cloud? I'm going to say in a hybrid environment. Okay. Um, and and uh, Siku, I don't mind if you want to start first and then we can move to Brian and Philippa. I can see you making notes there, but dude, I'm coming for you straight after this. So just to answer this uh, in the cloud, in the cloud, normally the cloud providers, they, 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 they've got this uh, controls in place uh, in, in terms of uh, IM. So I think in terms of uh, more, uh, in terms of IM, I think uh, from the technical and, and um, 
technical and strategy, uh, Brian will answer that. However, uh, if you use any cloud provider, they should provide you with uh, IM and IM policy is the one that drives uh, access within your, your, your cloud environment. And normally there's also baseline and uh, configurations as well in terms of uh, IM, how you drive IM policies within your environment that you want to expose this um, uh, uh, certain certain uh, uh, functions into the public network, or you want to restrict that access into your environment, uh, your, your your bucket where you store the data, how to control that bucket access into that bucket, because every everything is more around uh, IM driven as well as uh, API. So basically, uh, it's it's uh, IM policies that drives access into into everything within your cloud cloud tenant. Brian, do you want to dive into that one as well? Do you need me yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, CQ, absolutely spot on there with saying IAM is fundamental in that. And as you were saying, uh, Daniel, in it being a hybrid environment, that IAM is probably already within your infrastructure and you're federating your identity either across in the cloud environment or from a cloud environment. You know, we have Azure AD these days and similar kind of technologies which are based on LDAP with other cloud providers. Um, and you want to make sure there's consistency across your environments. And actually one area where I see a big risk in cloud is actually in the entitlements that are associated with the default accounts or the highly privileged accounts in the cloud, the things that are actually controlling the cloud and often those IAM components that Siku mentioned. Uh, so there's an, I have a four letter acronym for you, which is CIEM or Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management. And that's a mouthful, try saying that one, you've had a few. Yeah. Um, it, that's really about focusing on trying to make sure you understand who's been granted what out there and make sure that nobody has been granted anything that's unusual out there because that not only opens up a risk in your environment, but also could be a good indication that somebody has managed to compromise something in your environment and is changing things, however subtly, to start to gain uh, more access. But yeah, that hybrids where we are, whether we're ever going to get fully in the other direction, I don't know. But, you know, at the very base level, the problems are exactly the same. They're still computers. It's still software. It's still running on a machine somewhere. It still needs access. It, 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 the thing people need to do in many of these circumstances is not get overawed by what seems to be the size of the problem. Um, I often use a, a terminology of the big ball of string. Um, you, know, you look at a problem, it just looks like the biggest ball of string you've ever seen with lots and lots of loose ends. And my advice to that is just grab the first loose end you come to, you get to hand and start getting some progress, get some success under your belt. And that ball gets smaller, much quicker than you'll ever imagine. I'm going to um, um, ask Philippe a question, but while he's doing that, Brian, I want to, uh, I've had two or three questions regarding what is the technology makeup for a zero trust environment, which I'd like you to answer. But Philippe, what I'd like to ask you, is for a medium-sized company, let's say $75 million to $250 million annual, can we do this on our own? So can we go to Beyond Trust and, and get stuff or do we need partners? It, it, what is the makeup? Do I need to reskill everybody there? Can we even go down a zero trust road on our own or is the rapid bang for your buck getting Brian's talk, including a partner into this discussion? Well, I think it's, a, it's twofold, uh, Dan. And uh, first and foremost, from a trusted advisory perspective, of course, we can, we can advise and we can guide and assist. But um, our model is purely that. Uh, we do need a, a channel partner, preferably a partner in, in Africa that is, that is skilled, that has the ability and, and preferably local as well to be able to support our, uh, our customers in country, big or small. As Brian uh, alluded to earlier on, it, there's many um, foundations, there are many components that, that build up a zero trust. So it's important that we get the right people in to, to assist. Awesome. Okay, so there, so the 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 kind of leading edge to that question was the the threat actors are fairly sophisticated now. Can companies keep up with it, or is that where where specialists like Siku and his team come into it? 
Yeah, Brian, you can answer that. I can I can give a stab on that. Um, yeah, I think uh, Ziku kind of mentioned at one point script kid is as well, and I think there is uh, uh, the majority of the uh, people out there attacking you are in that space. I mean, the the deep web and the services that are provided there. Um, mean that anyone with a credit card can launch a ransomware attack or can have wow. a system go and look for vulnerabilities and accesses into an environment and even deploy the tools that need to be deployed um, to then wow. exfiltrate data. So there is still an enormous amount of that. And in my opinion, I, I would say 90% of the hacking is drive-by, as I'd call it. Um, yeah, those old Just enough incidentals. To- yeah, for those old enough to remember war games, uh, you know, as kids, we all wrote war games dialers where it would start at one telephone number, and just keep incrementing it until it got to the second. Yeah. Now we do that with IP addresses. Um, wow. And that, that's something you need to be conscious of. Um, so do you, uh, so Brian, are you seeing companies in your region just adopting zero trust? Is that kind of the, the, the standard now? And what's driving this adoption? Zero trust is definitely on the forefront of most people's minds, I think, and and I'm seeing that across the across the globe, um, and that's being driven by the changes in our working practices more than anything. It's okay. you know the the fortress mentality of we could build a big wall and sit behind it feeling relatively safe was always an illusion because it only took a disgruntled worker who's already inside the wall, or for the hacker to knock one block out of the wall and they're in. Now that's it. You, you've lost the game. So there, there was always a need to be more modular, more yeah. Yeah. focused in your perimeters. So every device in your environment, you should think of as having a perimeter. But zero trust drives you in that direction because it's saying, OK, um, in the past, we might ident- you know, authenticate you and authorize you with a big token that says you have access to all these things. And from the time you've logged in to the time you log out, that's you. Nothing changes. And those who have Windows environments will know the thing. If you add someone to a group, you've got to log out and log back in again to get your group memberships updated. Yes, yes. Zero trust goes, my identity gets to the system I'm trying to access. And it just goes, hang on a second. I'll, I'll just check you've still got access to that environment. It's still appropriate and that token's still valid. So it is kind of bringing those premises to each one of those. And as I say, entirely driven by the changes in the way we're operating. And, and that's going to affect everyone who's running IT. Just I think the cloud has brought those kind of things to everyone at the same time. Okay, I've got a secret. I've got a question from Sifosetu which is what is authenticated vulnerability scanning in a PAM environment? Uh, vulnerability in, in, in PAM uh, environment. Yes. I, I, think, I think that one uh, in terms of uh, privilege and, and access management. So when we're looking at uh, vulnerabilities and we try to address uh, issues related to, to PAM, also in light with a zero trust security module, and when we are talking about this uh, security module, we're talking about uh, as well as a uh, uh, zero trust network, zero trust data, zero trust identity, zero trust. Basically, that is that is a principle within within the environment. And we're also looking at when we want to uh, mitigate the risk, you need to also look. At, I'm, I'm still answering the the PEM uh, vulnerability. I got it. Also, I got it. <laughs> you, you but also basically, need to, we need to be neurotic. You need to not yes, trust yes. anyone. We're going to look at ourselves. Do we not yes, slow yes, business indeed. down like that, Siku? Do we not slow business down like that? Can I repeat that, Daniel? Do we not slow business down like that? Uh, uh, basically, security is an enabler. It's not a blocker. So it's to enable the business to ensure that you safeguard the environment within your estate, you reduce the security posture. It's not to block and say, no, you cannot deploy this application. You cannot do this. We just provide guidance that when you deploy this application, when you implement your your identity and management, you need to consider this uh, type of attacks. You need to implement this uh, type of controls to to, to mitigate the risk. It's not a blocker, it's an enabler. So, uh, um, uh, uh, no, no, I love that. It is related I like to, to I like that answer. So, could I, uh, could I add a little to that? Yeah, I love that. I like yeah, that. I, mean, I, 
I am so happy to hear Siku saying that um, it's it's not something you often hear said, and it's it's one of the things they talk about in terms of challenges because you you'll hear a lot about we need to educate our people, particularly about things like phishing attacks and etc. And that that is a really difficult thing to do because generally we are seen as the people who are saying no. No, you can't have iTunes on your laptop to listen to music at work because, oh, we can't, can't let it update and all these sorts of things. Um, but the technologies exist to allow your users to be enabled. So, you know, like the Beyond Trust, uh, we're very into what's called the principle of least privilege. So this was a, a saying that goes all the way back to 1973 and a man called Jerome Saltzer, who was one of the architects of the Multix operating system, which is like the grandfather to Unix. And he wrote uh, that each process and user should have the least privilege necessary to operate. Um, let's face it, no operating system since then really does it or does it well in any way, shape or form, which is really disappointing. <laughs> Um, but the technology is there to enable you to do that. So users are only ever standard users. They never change. But we can then enable them to install iTunes and just iTunes from Apple. Uh, and the update for that can run with the necessary privileges without giving any other privilege on the system or putting any other risk in there. And risk is an important thing because we are talking to business people here. They just Yes. yes. So like when we go that route, we begin to be the guys saying yes all the time. And hopefully then I think our, our you know, staff, et cetera, will come along on the journey because we're the good guys. We help them do stuff. Uh, and you can take that a step further and say, and Siku really did uh, mention this with, the, uh, with business. I often refer to what we do, not as cybersecurity, but it's business mm -hmm. continuity planning. Um, because when you're hacked, you can't do business because you're too busy running around trying to get everything working. You can look at Maersk as an example of that. They spent what, six weeks back in paper uh, trying to move uh, containers around. Um, so when you've got good cybersecurity, you're watching your competitors struggle with being attacked while you're sailing along having a, having a good time doing business. Oh, I like that. We've, we've got a great question from Jean-Paul, which um, kind of I asked earlier, but he's just asked it much better than I did. So, Philippe, this is for you. Um, is there somewhere where he can see detailed documented steps of how we can build a zero trust model and providing access to enterprise data and information to relevant users? It does Beyond Trust have a knowledge bank that our, our, um, um, our guests can go and see? Is there a knowledge base? Is there a repository? Do you have white papers? What, what can we get from a zero trust perspective? Um, from beyond trust and then i'm going to ask siku where can we go and learn from other people as well yeah so so there is some information that of course we let you share the, um, on our website we have uh, information available as well but i think the best uh, guideline would be the NIST, NIST, uh, the national institute of standards to 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 see your progression and uh, compliance and auditory i think it's all all relevant and it's all very much available you mentioned earlier on big or small organizations can follow that particular uh, uh, process, but these by all means, I'll, I'll gladly assist uh, and share information. So we can go onto the Beyond Trust website and we can get white papers and, and case studies there as well. Um, yeah, to, with some information, of course, some is, is uh, relevant to, to us sharing it. Thank you very much. I think uh, Brian has already just put up the NITS, um, thank you, uh, the NITS uh, link. So there's, okay. there's a vast amount of information and it's a guideline. There's, there's uh, the standard that one needs to follow for organizations with, um, of course, uh, compliance and auditory concerns. That's the best way to go about it. Siku, where, can, where do you suggest we go and get a, a different perspective on it? Where can we start? Where do you suggest people go and self-educate on zero trust? So, so... In terms of uh, zero trust, uh, Microsoft as well provide uh, this uh, knowledge and and to understand how to actually mitigate against uh, uh, security related uh, issues, uh, particularly as we we're looking at uh, identity uh, with a beyond trust. I think we also need to understand the best practice for for password hygiene and password management. So that is key as well in terms oh, of uh, identity, because the first thing that an attacker would do is to gain an initial access into the environment. What is that? Initial access basically is to 
uh, credential harvesting is the tactics and techniques around how to uh, uh, still pass it, whether you, you, you construct a, a, a dropper, you send it via a phishing attack, you want to gain some information from the user, you want to uh, gather this uh, credentials. So we need to be able to manage that. That is also part of uh, uh, to adopt uh, best practices around that, which is uh, another component of um, uh, this uh, zero trust uh, module. So zero trust is not only identity and access management. Yes, identity and access management, it forms part of this. It's, it's key, it's very important. It grants you access into the environment, but you also need to look at other controls as you implement this uh, zero trust end to end. That's awesome, thank you very much. I've got one more uh, question from Brighton, and then I want to ask about your forward thinking, Brian and, and Philippe and, and Siku. Uh, Brighton is saying for isolation, monitoring and auditing privilege sessions, does PAM help on firewall level only or does it go to application level as well, i.e. onto your ERP system, your procurement system, your HR system? Now, Brian, can you dive into that one and, and let me know? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that uh, privilege sessions uh, head or, or come to you for any privileged access irrespective of okay. what the end system looks like it's not just about managing your firewall it's about managing your servers it's about managing your endpoints but it does go out into your applications um you know uh, our product password safe will manage sessions out to your erp systems you have support for things like sap etc um you can go further than that and access just about any system um with privileged accounts and and through that you're never releasing the credentials you're changing the credentials every time they use because the machines doing the authentication you use massively long entirely random passwords using cryptographic random number generators so that they can't be predicted and all this kind of goodness this good source that goes on uh, the technologies so yeah it's 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 as broad as you want it to be but again i would always caution people to say that any kind of cybersecurity, zero trust especially, is a journey. It's not something you do in one big bite. So even within that, don't get overwhelmed by the, the scope of the, you know, I've got thousands of applications, how am I ever going to do this? Lots of them are never going to need any privileged access or it's going to be very limited. Um, some of them are not really worth protecting because the data that's in them is publicly accessible. All those kind of things you have to assess. But I keep, I will keep going back to get the basics right, get your infrastructure secured properly and the access to that infrastructure secured properly because that's the piece that Siku mentioned. Everything's built on top of that. It's, it's a chain and you've got to make sure that the base links of the chain are secured and you work your way up the chain. But you know, do it at your pace, do it, when it how it works for you. So I, I saw something in preparation, which is just in time, zero trust. Are, are we taking this too far? I mean, are we trying to make it cool for the sake of making it cool? Or is that a real, is that now a real thing, um, uh, uh, Brian? There are two things that have been brought together, to be honest with you. Just in time uh, existed before zero trust. We talked about just in time in PAM, uh, in access management generally, in fact, and it's around, you know, not having any standing privileges, as you might call it. So, as I said, you know, everyone's a standard user, including the people administering your environment. They never log in directly with any kind of privileged access. So they have zero standing privileges. When they need access to something, that's the point at which the privilege is granting. So just in the time you need it. And ideally, if you've got a strong change management process, which I consider fundamental in a cybersecurity strategy, you've also got a window of operation. So they only get the access for that yes. time. Um, well, almost like when we bring contractors on for a project. Exactly. So, Siku, are you seeing customers embrace this just in time for PAM, just in time for access? Is this a, is this a more and more common trend? Uh, yes, yes, uh, indeed. It's good in terms of uh, managing to manage your 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 identity within uh, the environment, whether it's uh, on cloud or it's on 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 prem. So, I think one something that I would like to add there is. As we drive in this, and I like uh, Brian when he said this uh, zero trust is a journey. It's a journey in terms of uh, adopting uh, zero trust into your organization. But you also need to look at this uh, through the lenses of uh, 
uh, minimizing the risk through the lenses of uh, also uh, addressing uh, vulnerabilities related to a uh, password, uh, password hygiene, how we, we manage this across the estate, and also some of the implementation around multi-factor authentication. We also need to implement all these uh, controls and to adopt a uh, password safe. Uh, uh, it's one of uh, something that Beyond Trust also provide, a uh, password safe, how to, to store your, your credentials as well as uh, making it a random randomness. So, okay. so uh, I, and I also like the, uh, it, it also, Brian also mentioned uh, less privileges. So less privileges also talks to the principle of minimality that you grant a user an access that they require to perform their, their uh, for their role. This is uh, tied to role-based uh, access access control. So it's also based uh, uh, tied to that as well. This is assuming, obviously, we understand our applications, we understand our business, and we understand what people need to do. And uh, staff turnover is in jobs and, and roles. So, Philippe, I've got a question for you. Um, it's more of a philosophical one. On a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 being it's not even started yet, 10 being, you know, you doing customer visits just to ensure that, that, that they've got access to brochures because they've got um, zero trust bedded down. Where do you think we are as a continent embracing zero trust in your opinion? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a hot topic right now and uh, it has been, I'd say, for, for the last year or so. However, on the continent, I think we're still very, very far behind. There's a lot of work to be done, um, a lot of education, a lot of awareness. But uh, if I have to rate it from a zero to 10, and please don't quote me, this is, this is purely on, on a general... This is live, dude, uh, we're quoting uh, you. So, <laughs> and we're so what you say here is, I'll, is I'll whatever. A very, a very trim four, three and wow. four, I think. Uh, three and four uh, rating out of 10, absolutely. Yeah, of course, some organizations are, are well on their way, eight. But um, it's, it's a process. There, there, there are many components. There's, there's a lot of work to be done, and, and of course, you know, it's, it's the, the administration thereafter. So it's not just a, a plug and play and hope for mm. the best. Mm. There's a lot of work to be done thereafter. What would it take to get us to a six? What would your next steps be that you would look for? Well, so, so one one would need to identify each each organisation is, is very different, but identify where the pain points are, where the gaps and and the uncertainties lie. And then guide them from there. So you know, many many organisations already um, encompass income, income, oh, your pardon, have taken on uh, firewalls, endpoint, um, you know, other antiviruses and other components leading up. Uh, as we mentioned, it's a process. It's, it's many layers that are going to form zero zero trust. So I think yeah, that that's a starting point. And then let us let us guide you and advise. On, on the next steps, on, on what to what to add, you know, privilege access management from a, from you know, let's say banking, um, government. Uh, there's a lot of components that need to be compliant and tick those boxes. So awesome. uh, let us guide you with that. Philippe, so my last question for you before I get to Brian and Siku um, to wrap. If you had um, a ticket to any security knowledge share conference coming up in the next 12 months, what would it be to attend and why would it? Why would you go to that particular conference? Yeah, probably um, something where, where we're elaborating and, and adding on to, to Zero Trust. Um, so as I mentioned, it is a hot topic. Um, I think it covered, covers a vast array of many components that, that, would, that would form a, a complete security solution. There's no, there's no such... Um, one size fits all. So, you know, it's pick and choose, but certainly another zero trust component to, uh, to add. Okay. Brian, for you, um, looking ahead, what's coming out of this table that uh, from a beyond trust perspective that we should be excited about? And uh, what's on the horizon for you? What the new change is coming? Yeah, I think it's, you know, cloud is the the next frontier so to speak uh, we're kind of already fairly well into it uh, given that it's probably 20 years old in many ways um, but 
from a beyond trust perspective more and more focus we already have a product out there available in cloud um, form so they can be consumed as services um, our portfolio covers a lot of the privileged access management space probably the broadest coverage of any vendor um, but we'll be bringing that more together into a single uh, solution that is uh, cloud-based, much more leveraging things like machine learning. Um, I don't like AI because we haven't got AI. <laughs> We've got machine <laughs> learning. Um, but machine learning, it, it helps deal with the, what I've often said as the, one of the biggest problems we have as cybersecurity professionals is that every morning you open up your machine, there's a tsunami of data comes at you and just trying to pick out the little pieces while also start trying to firefight everything else that's going on, the relevant actions is difficult. So tooling is with everyone gonna move more towards that, more I'm gonna help you do your job as opposed to just giving you like a hammer, this is gonna tell you which nails you need to hammer in as well, that sort of thing. Outstanding, thank you for joining us, giving us your time this morning. Siku, as our guest of honor, the bell at the ball, um, I want to ask you, if you were talking to um, new work entrants, what would you say to them from security as a career? Why would they take security as a career uh, for new entrants into this market? So I think um, as a career, basically, it, uh, it exposes you to uh, different technology and to understand uh different uh, processes and also how to understand uh, in terms of uh, mitigating mitigating against uh, the risk. Basically security is all about uh, reducing the risk and uh, mitigations around, around the risk. So it's a very interesting interesting space to be in. And with, uh, I think in this space, you also need to understand different technologies. You need to understand uh, processes. You also need to understand uh, how people, they interact with a uh, technology and what uh, 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 risk related to uh, technologies, people process uh, and technology. I think it's a very, very interesting space. Uh, we, we learn a lot uh, in this, um, in this space of uh, cybersecurity. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting space to be in. Outstanding. It's always changing and always challenging. I think if yes. you're still learning after all this time, then you've chosen the right place. We do have a question for you, Brian, from LinkedIn, um, but I'm going to actually ask you to answer it um, on email for Rachel, who's asking in this era of digital finance and fintech, what cybersecurity controls would you recommend? Um, but I'm not going to ask you to answer that now because we are all one minute and I can see the bosses come onto the call. So for me, for, for the three of you, thank you for um, putting up with me, jumping around and asking all these questions. Thank you for educating our audience. The Beyond Trust team for sponsoring today. It makes knowledge share something we can get across the continent. I hope you as attendees have learned as much as I have. Daniel Robus, your host, handing the ball back to Kerry. Thanks, Dad. And thanks again to you guys for attending.